Greetings, Richard Fulmer here. Welcome to another edition of Richard's Rock Rambles. So we're going to carry on with our prog rock journey and we're going to have another look at the band Rush. We're doing the Rush band in three parts. So we've had a look at the 70s, the moustaches, the long flowing robes, the platform shoes. We're going to leave that all behind and we're going to go on into the 80s. An era which would Funnily enough, be their most successful, especially in terms of album sales, uh, still big tours. Um, a lot of the sort of traditional Rush fans, the guys who liked the early stuff, couldn't quite get their head around what they were doing in the 80s. The first two albums actually still sounded a bit like the 70s. There were still a few long tracks, um, intricate time changes, that kind of thing. But for the most part, they left that behind. You know, they kind of decided that they'd gone as far as they could with that particular style of music and the long epic tracks the, you know very long albums one song one whole side of an album kind of thing and they wanted to strip it down concentrate more on the sort of compact songs uh, the songwriting would still be very good uh, when you've got a lot, guy like Neil Peart in your band who was their lyricist you couldn't go wrong so that's what we're going to have a look at today, the band in the 80s. As I said, the, probably their most successful album comes out of this period, and uh, we'll get to that in a minute. And then in the third episode, we're going to have a look at their stuff from the 90s, going on into the 2000s, and then finally up to their, their last album. So let's dive in. The first album we're going to chat about is one of my favorites from the 80s, probably my favorite from that period and it's an album called Permanent Waves. Um, there's not a lot of tracks on here, there's six tracks on here, the longest being about nine minutes and 17 seconds. Still produced by Terry Brown, they would kept him on as their producer. You know they were almost like a family with this guy and um, he'd done pretty well for them so far so they stuck with him. Uh, the tracks on here, The Spirit of Radio, Free Will, which is an amazing track, Great lyrics, um, and you'll see in the 80s and going forward into the 90s and the 2000s that Geddy Lee's vocals had gone down a bit. You know, it's not that sort of high-pitched screeching that he was doing in the 70s. I think he realized that the 80s style of music that was around at the time didn't call for that, so he brought it down, and it really worked. Uh, it became a lot more accessible to the masses, I think. Um, so Free Will, Jacob's Ladder, which is a great track, some amazing guitar work from Alex Lifeson on all these tracks, and of course the drumming from Neil Peart is superb. Entree New, Different Strings, and my favorite track, Natural Science, which is the 9 minutes and 17 seconds song. So yeah, this is a great album. Um, the follow-up one would be their big breakthrough album, but I think Permanent uh, Waves has got a lot going for it. Uh, you can see the guys there, Geddy Lee in the middle with his big glasses on. Their look had also changed. As I said, they lost the moustaches and the robes and what have you. Went, down, went for a more stripped down look. Alex Lifeson had his hair chopped as well. So that was from 1980, the beginning of the 80s, Permanent Waves. Then we come to their biggest selling album of all time, and the biggest hits came off this album. They played tracks off this album right up until the end. In fact, they had to, especially the first track. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about moving pictures. This is such an amazing album. You know, they, what they did here was they incorporated some of the intricacies of the early albums with a modern take on things, an 80s take on things. Um, they hadn't yet reached the sort of total electronic drum sound and synths, which would come a bit later. So it still has that 70s feel, the analog feel, but it's just got a modern touch to it. Um, there's, a, there's an instrumental on here called YYZ, which is the third track. Incredible stuff. One of the best instrumental tracks you'll ever hear. And there you can see the, the, the full arsenal of Geddy Lee on bass and Neil Peart on drums, along with Alex Lifeson, of course. Still produced by Terry Brown. So let's see what we have here. Tom Sawyer, the biggest hit ever. I mean, everybody knows the words to that. In fact, if you ever get hold of the DVD of Rush in Rio, in South America, incredible. Those guys 
sing along to everything. They knew every single word from Tom Sawyer. They even sing along to the instrumentals. They, they're quite rabid rock fans in that part of the world. So that was the really big hit off here. The second track, Red Barchetta, that song about the car, the racing car. It was a really cool music video that went with that particular track as well. Then we get to YYZ, the instrumental I mentioned. Stunning track. Limelight, The Camera Eye, Witch Hunt, and Vital Signs. Witch Hunt and Vital Signs are often overlooked in this album, but I think they're really good tracks as well with some nice synth work. You know, there's not, it's not overbearing. It's just enough at this stage. Um, I really love that album cover there. Play on words, moving pictures. Um, let's see if there's anything I can show you inside. There's a picture of Giddy. I think, it, and there's Alex. And let's see if this picture of old Neil. No. In any case, he um, he changed bases for the 80s. I think he left the Rickenbackers behind in the 70s. And he um, started using, I think, Fenders. Uh, but he has such an amazing bass collection to this day. I just want to briefly mention, it's not a studio album, but they made many live albums um, in their career. The early one I forgot to mention last time was All the World's a Stage, which was this um, live album from the 70s output. And then there's one from the 80s called Rush Exit Stage Left, which features a lot of tracks from Moving Pictures. It was on this tour that they recorded this live album. Amazing live album, great drum solos, guitar work, keyboards, bass, the whole nine yards. Um, and it's got all the tracks on here, Spirit of Radio, Red Bocchetta, YYZ, Passage to Bangkok, Jacob's Ladder, The Trees. They play a lot of the old stuff as well, and they play it really well. There was an accompanying video which came out for this. I don't think that's ever been released on DVD. I'm, I stand to be corrected. But um, nevertheless, it's a really good one to see if you can get a hold of it. So then we move on to 1982's album, Signals. And with this album, you can see the songs are starting to get shorter. There's keyboards and the synths are making a lot more of their presence felt. Um, and this, but the songs are still amazing. You know, with, blessed with Neil Peart, who's writing the songs, you couldn't go wrong. Subdivisions, that was the first track, really good track on there. All about, uh, you know, the way people get categorized in life. The Analog Kid, Chemistry, Digital Man, another good track, The Weapon, New World Man, Losing It, and Countdown, which is a sort of a space-themed track. Um, yeah, you can show you what the... You can see they're starting to look a lot more lean and clean in the 80s. So I think on this album and probably subsequent albums, you can start hearing Neil Peart using the electronic drums, which I'm not a fan of. I love analog drums. But, you know, it was the 80s and everybody was doing it. So they jumped on the bandwagon with that. And I think Rush managed to still keep their own identity while still having hugely successful albums. One of the few bands from the sort of prog rock era, the early prog rock bands who were able to move into the 80s and still get a new audience and still, you know, be vibrant and, and innovative without losing their trademark, if you like. I think the other band that really did that well was Genesis, who totally changed from Peter Gabriel um, into Phil Collins led Genesis, but that's a story for another day. Then we move on to Grace Under Pressure. It's the vinyl that I have. Um, and there's a picture of the guys. You see what I mean? They are uh, looking a little different there. What do we have on here? We have Distant Early Warning, which is a great track. After Image, Red Sector A, The Enemy Within, The Body Electric, Kid Gloves, Red Lenses, Between the Wheels. And this is now produced by Peter Henderson. So they've left their previous producer. I think Terry Brown uh, was on the last... Yeah, he was on Moving Pictures. I don't think he was on Signals. So they've got a new producer here, and it's a lot more electronic. Um, you can see which way they're going with this. Still Rush, still great musicianship, um, but they are changing. So I'm, I struggled to get into this at first, as I did with some of the subsequent albums. 
This one I really struggled with. This is from 1985. It's the, uh, the album called Power Windows. Um, I found this way too sparse, too empty. There wasn't a lot going on. There was some great bass work and drumming and, and what have you. Don't get me wrong, but I just did, it didn't grab me. You know, it took me a while. And they say with age comes wisdom. I'm not so sure about that, but I think with age, you you're able to forgive things a lot more than what you did in your youth. And you grow to enjoy them and you see different things and you hear things differently with your ears. So the big money, which is a big track off here, Grand Designs, Manhattan Project, Marathon, Territories, Middletown Dreams, Emotion Detector and Mystic Rhythms, which is a, probably the best track on here, Mystic Rhythms. It's a very memorable, great chorus um, and good songwriting as well. I think a lot of these tracks work better in the live situation, which of course they always work well in live situations. So yeah, not one of my, my favorite Rush albums. And then we get to probably my least favorite from this particular era, the 80s, and that's Hold Your Fire by Rush. I think they featured Amy Mann on here on backing vocals. Um, she appears on a few tracks. There's nothing on here that's really, it doesn't grab you. you know, it's, it's still good. I mean, they've never made a bad album. It's just that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't resonate with me as some of the other ones did. I mean, if I look through these tracks, and there's about 9 or 10 here, Force 10, Time Stands Still, that was a hit, um, Lock and Key, Turn the Page, I, there's nothing here that really grabs me. But um, and this is Peter Collins, a different producer again. Yeah, I think we'd do a few with him. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not really my cup of tea, and you can see they're looking very... Very mod there, especially Giddy Lee with his ponytail. I don't think that ever really worked. In any case, that's Hold Your Fire. Then we get to the album Presto, the final studio album from the 80s. And I think with this one, they were trying to get back to more guitar orientated sound. I think Alex Larson was a, if you watch the documentary, he said that he was getting a bit sort of peed off. You know, so guys, I do play guitar, you sort of pushing me outside with all these keyboards, masses of keyboards and, thys and synths, which Geddy Lee was introducing into their sound. Um, the tracks on here are really good. I, this is one of the albums from the 80s that I do reach for, if I'm looking for stuff from that era. Show, Don't Tell, Chain Lightning, The Pass, which is a, probably the best track on here. Um, very memorable track. Good choruses. War Paint, Scars, the title track, Presto, Superconductor, also a really good track. Anagram, Red Tide, Hand Over Fist, and Available Light. And now they have a different producer here, Rupert Hine. So they were chopping and changing in the 80s and the 90s. Presto. And then I just want to finally mention another live album from the 80s, A Show of Hands. I think this also came out on DVD or video. Um, you can see even their stage setup was a little stripped down very different, very clinical, very totally different feel to the 70s. Um, but of course, the musicianship and everything else was amazing on here. Great. I mean, they never brought out a bad live album. Um, big Money, Subdivisions, Marathon, Manhattan Project, Force 10. In fact, if you look at the tracks on here, you see they totally scaled back on the early 70s stuff. There's very little on from the 70s that I play. I think Closer to the Heart is probably the only thing from the 70s that I play on here. Maybe one or two others. Um, let's see if there's anything I can show you. Yeah, there's some nice shots of the band there live. I just didn't really care much for the look there with old Giddy and what have you. But in any case, and, and Neil Pert there with one of his many drum kits that were, I think were customized for him. Amazing drummer. If you think about the influence these guys had on a lot of the sort of prog rock bands that came later, like. Dream Theater, Spock's Beard, Porcupine Tree, all those guys were influenced by Rush. By the 70s output, as well as the 80s and the 90s, um, the different textures they brought and the different sounds and the, the incredible bass work and drumming and what have you, that was going to rub off on other guys. And a lot of those guys cite Rush as major influences. So there we have it, Rush in the 80s, a little different. Um, I know it alienated a lot of the early fans, uh, like myself, but I, as I said, I came around to 
enjoying the, the 80s output later. So then in the next episode, we're going to have a look at the 90s going into the 2000s. And I also want to mention quite a few of their live DVDs, of which there are many. Some stunning stuff there. And a book as well, which is quite interesting. So I'll see you guys next time. Take it easy. Please like and subscribe down below. Tell me what you think. Give me your favorite Rush albums. Always interesting to see. And uh, take care out there. It's a bit crazy. Hopefully... Sooner than later, we can have some live action again from bands. I think we're all missing that. And, you know, I think the artists are missing that too. Those guys are really struggling. You know, with things like Spotify and what have you at the moment, the guys, the money they make is minimal. And what they did make on touring has now also been taken away. So it's pretty tough out there. In any case, have yourselves a good one, and I'll see you guys soon. Cheers.